Mark Rothko was a color field painter, and he was put in the school or sometimes called an abstract expressionist. But I think this is slightly incorrect if you think about the painting in terms of a physical description. The best way to kind of look at a Rothko painting is to describe it in terms of its texture, color, its composition, and that'll give you an entryway. Rothko's paintings have a lot of trouble in terms of being archival. Uh, when you refer to a painting in terms of its archival qualities, you're talking about how permanent it is, uh, whether or not it's going to rot or fall apart. In the case of these big canvases, the artist used oil paint, and the paint that, or the thing that binds the pigment or the paint particles to the canvas, is linseed oil. And the problem with what Rothko did is that instead of using something thick layers of oil paint called impostos, um, which are thick paint and you probably have this proportion of 75% uh, paint particles to 25% linseed oil, Rothko would add linseed oil and uh, turpentine and almost wash the color off. and it, a very high proportion of paint thinner. And when he does this, he's actually washing away the glue that would hold the painting together. If you look at the paintings, you'll see that this kind of shows through a bit in the painting. It looks a little bit chalky. And I think conservators um, are having trouble with these paintings because sometimes they're a little chalky and they rub off. And so they need to fix that. So the paintings aren't about texture, they're more about color and form. And so in order to understand the Rothko painting, uh, what you're supposed to appreciate about it, you have to know a little bit about color theory and how color theory works. And color theory is kind of important and a little confusing. It's almost like algebra because there are these two elements to it. Um, you have some t the purity of the color, sometimes referred to as the intensity or saturation, and it just basically means when you say something's really an intense color, it's the color it is when you squeeze it straight out of the tube. Okay. The other term is the name of the color, which is also called hue. So when you're referring to a hue, you're literally referring to the name of the color. I think that the most understandable painting uh, in terms of this is called Earth and Green. And let me analyze it for you, give you some reasons why it's probably the more important painting. He uses three colors, three hues. He uses this Prussian blue, it might be ultramarine, which is at its purest intensity. Then and he uses a sort of muted green that has some white in it that almost makes it sort of pastel, but it's also kind of grayed out, so it's not a very intense or saturated color. And then he uses this cadmium red, which is, it almost leans towards orange, and it sort of leaps out at you. And when we talk about these colors, we, we're referring to them as warm and cool. If you think about color, um, blue and green and blue-green, those are colors that are associated with water. And we tend to, if you look at a picture, even a photograph, uh, Renaissance artists knew this, atmospheric perspective, blue and grays sink back into the background, okay? Now, warmer colors that are associated with yellows and reds, they have more energy and they project forward. And so artists have used this for a long time to describe where something is in the picture plane, and it happens naturally. So when you look at a painting, the warm, cool relationship of colors makes a color either move forward or move backwards into the picture plane. So if you were to uh, let your eye rest on this painting, I think that you'd see that um, it almost feels like the squares on the background are floating. And it appears as if the blue in the background is the background, I guess. Um, the green square, which is this muted green, is sort of between the red plane and the blue plane. 
And so he makes these squares floating almost as if they're an illusion of reality, um, almost as if they're a kind of landscape, even though they're abstract paintings. Now, some historians, and I think Rothko would agree with this, that's why I'm bringing it up, say that he meant his paintings to be spiritual and get at some sort of essential essence. And this is in keeping with a lot of what people have been thinking about with Rothko in terms of his art. But we'll return to that later. Probably composition is the next important element that you need to look at. If you think about it, it's a vertical rectangle. And in the center, just away from the edges, you've got these floating red and green rectangular boxes. And they literally kind of feel like they're floating. And when this happens, it almost looks like uh, buildings or grass and sky, that kind of thing. Um, it has this quality of having um, the illusion of being something that's actually there, but it's not, right? That ties in with uh, some of the ideas that I want to bring forward. So I think you need to reduce it down to several qualities. Uh, the paintings for Rothko are thin and washy. He uses color theory, warm and color, warm and cool color relationships. He has these geometric forms or rectangles floating in a large other plane of color. And if you look at these aspects, I think you'll be able to interpret his paintings a little bit more along the lines of what some of the other historians have said about it. And just to, you know, back this up a little bit, Rothko himself basically said that he was trying to get to some spiritual essence. And he says this in various places, but I think this quote is pretty good. He says, it would be good if little places could be set up all over the country, like a little chapel where a traveler or a wanderer could come for an hour to meditate on a single painting hung in a small room and by itself. Now, <clears throat> that vision was later on turned into the Rothko Chapel in 1965. Um, it's interesting because he died in 1970, and we'll talk about that in a second. There are several essays, uh, an entire book, <laughs> uh, which I had to read as an undergrad, devoted to looking at Rothko's paintings as if there's some sort of transcendentalist landscape along the lines of the romantic painters from the 19th century, like Caspar David Friedrich. Um, I think it's reasonable to make the leap or jump um, that looking at these 19th century painters like Caspar David Friedrich, they were attempting to show um, basically the power of nature as if it was a spiritual force. And they would do this through the landscape paintings that they worked on. And so a lot of times they'll address things uh, like fire, which is something you can't control, or storms. And those would be symbols of some sort of spirituality for them. And if you look at the colors in Rothko's paintings, and, you know, I guess it's pretty clear that it, it, there could be a sort of link between these painters, especially when you make the um, assumption, which is true, which, you, you know, he's an educated, uh, privileged white male, more or less. Um, he would have been aware of the traditions in art history, especially from the previous century. And so I think that uh, Robert Rosenblum probably had a pretty good interpretation of this. So what does this mean? I guess what it really means is that the pictures are not realistic. They're not unrepresentational, uh, a lot in the way of uh, some of the abstract expressions, such as Pollock and Lee Krasner, his wife, who was also a very good painter. And first and foremost, there's also a sort of contextual element in which he was associated, hung out and drank with the abstract expressioners, expressionist painters of the mid 20th century. And so those painters also, especially Pollock, talked about the spiritual meanings behind their paintings. And I don't think you can underestimate that. All right, so let's take a look at the context of Rothko's career. Um, many of the other painters who made the history books, like Rothko, 
hung out in New York in the 1950s in this community. They had the same type of thinking, the same beliefs as Rothko did. Um, I think that because he lived in New York in the 1950s and hung out with other artists, uh, other elements uh, that sort of took place uh, helping to make him famous and important and increase the monetary value of the painting was that he dies young in 1970. And there's some evidence that um, he might have, uh, he might have been killed. Uh, supposedly, um, the controversy around his suicide is that there's elements you can look into it, but right after his suicide, um, the gallery that was representing him started selling his work, and then they didn't give any of the proceeds to Rothko's widow. Um, I've had some teachers also say that they think that the quality of the painting dropped significantly. So those are reasons why he could have been murdered to increase the value of the painting and, and certainly add to the shadiness. So I just thought that that would be the most important stuff that you need to know about him.